welcome to the Pod Podcast Cast. I'm Insuling. I'm Mark. And I'm Jarrett. And tonight we're going to be telling you all about the Lintha Pirates and the western direction of Exalted. We're just going to be chatting about our general thoughts on it, as well as like how to have fun in the West, how to actually enjoy it. Yeah, and we're also going to be talking about the Lintha. Yeah, the oh. Lintha. They're a... Uh, well, insulting, why don't you give a brief ex- description of them? All right, well, the, the Lintha are often used in the books as the pirates. They're, they're kind of these monstrous other things. And they can breathe water. They are descendants from a pre-human race of people that were known as the Lintha, who have since died out. Their story is over. It kind of doesn't matter anymore. Um, on a future lore episode, maybe when we get into Kimberi, which is the uh, the Yozi slash Primordial who made the Lintha, we could really, really get into that cool lore. But I think for now, I'd really rather keep it to modern day. So modern Lintha know that they're different from other people. For one thing, they typically have either gills or just somehow the ability to breathe. They're a little bit taller than humans. They're stronger and they can use some magic powers that are beyond your normal human uh, ability to use. And all of these things kind of make them these terrors on the ocean. They were kind of driven to piracy basically by the bigotry of humanity and the exalted. Like I said, they were the other. And in the war against the primordials, they fought for their mother. They fought for the one who made them. And even into the modern day, they still ha- bear the burden of that choice. They are very interesting set pieces, and in especially the West, where they live on these islands that are ex- they're, they're very difficult to get to. They really kind of fell in like the, the Davy Jones feel from Pirates of the Caribbean. Their captains are weird, their, their, their sailors are weird, and they're mysterious. They're, since you can't just go to where they live, you don't really know about how, what their families are like, who raises their children. You don't really get to see a lot of that. And so I love the idea of like, humanizing them a little bit, because they basically are humans at this point. What do you guys feel about them? I really really like the Lintha. They're basically demon fish pirates, which is super cool. Like, just the idea, just saying it. Demon fish monster pirates. Demon fish monster pirates. Yeah, that's a pretty good feel. Yeah. The idea is cool. There's also the fact, and this is something that's touched on the West book that was released during second edition, is they also kind of, and this is again, optional lore. You can modify it as you wish, and we encourage you to, honestly. Yeah. But basically, it's kind of like the Mafia. They have, like, this weird group that they're really obsessed with keeping genetic purity and trying to stay lintha e. Like, they want to... Basically, they have the Mafia. Like, think if you do Vampire the Masquerade, think the Giovanni. They're like that, but pirate demon fish dudes. That's what they are. And it's cool. They're designed clearly to be the enemy splat. They're, they are horrifically... Or not splat. The enemy pirate people. They're horrifically evil by the base lore, which gives like heroic characters pretty much free reign to kill them without any real moral repercussions. Now, there's other things you can do with the Lintha that's much more interesting, and we'll get into that. But by baseline, they're designed to be evil monsters that you can kill that look kind of like people, but aren't really people, because they're also monsters who... Just their entire society is just horrifically <laughs> evil on a on an almost comical level. It's really horrible. They're uh, a really good uh, setting implement to put into your game. <laughs> uh, and Insulin, they came up with this alternate take on the Lintha and how to run them in your games. And so I think that he would probably be the best one to explain, like, our idea of Lintha. A- aside from the official lore, which you can look up the lore. It's it's interesting. I've uh, I've read through it. It's, it's cool. Like, you can totally do that, no problems. But there's other things you can do with the Lintha, too. Yeah. 
Yeah, like, I love the idea of, like, you if you somehow end up going to the bottom of the ocean, you come ap- across this city, and there's functional people there. Like, there's there's a society, there's infrastructure, and you discover that there's there are Lintha down there, and sh- maybe you even meet some of the pirates that you met in the beginning of your game when you were fighting against, you know, the, the, the bad pirates, and you learn that they're all just people, like, that's their day job but they don't bring their work home with them. They go up to the surface to get things that they can't really produce down in, in the ocean, and they use them for whatever they need them for. You basically end up kind of humanizing the other, even if you keep them alien in their own ways. By humanizing them, you can make them cool and make them people. And if they're people, albeit normally morally dubious people, <laughs> it's you actually have to think because in baseline lore there's really no reason not to just genocide them they are as a group horrifically evil in a almost puritan way but if you kind of push a bit more humanity into them make them you know people who yeah they're doing things that are wrong but they're not like they're still a culture yeah it's like a whole group and that can give players a bit more hesitation to just jump in and start genociding because they're not the BBEG. Yeah. Yeah, they're just people. And there, there's a lot of these. Like, the reason I'm talking about the Lintha a lot is because there are other uh, different kinds of humans that were created throughout the ages. And a lot of them were actually made by the Exalted, including the uh, Panda people. They're, they're small and they have these, like, panda markings on their bodies. And they're typically bald, and they... Jalas, there we go. Uh, the Jala people are a race you can be. Like, it doesn't change your stats any. You just say, like, yeah, I just want to be that thing. And you can do it. You're you're just a person, but you're you're different. If you have children, they'll be little Jala children. And I wish that there were... I wish that there were more examples of this. Like, I had an idea for this where you're... You're in this undersea city, and you come across these Lintha, but these Lintha are also living with these human snake people whose legs have been replaced with these like eel-like paddle tails, and it turns out they're they're just different people like who live with the Lintha. They're not evil. They're not doing it because they're all demon worshippers. They're all just people. They just want to live their lives, but they have to live under the ocean because they don't breathe air. That that means that when you encounter Lintha, it's more than just oh, hey, it's the unrepentant monsters. Let's go murder them. Instead, you can actually interact with them and, you know, maybe find out how you're similar to them and how you're different. And that's cool. It lets you... Again, it's the same thing with how I've always suggested, if not removing, then at least decreasing some of the anti-solar, lunar, and abyssal hate in the setting. Because it's like the realm. The realm's cool, but really the only people that ever get to experience it are the dragon blooded because you can't be a lunar just wandering around the realm you'll get murdered and it means you can't really role play with other dragon blooded without making really weird excuses as to why they're all cool with the lunar walking around unless you're hiding the fact that you're a lunar and it's the same thing with these guys if they're just pure unrepentant monsters there's no way to interact with them in a non-murder way you don't want them to be murder hobos like oh i see a length of ship well, I guess I'll just go fire at it, or just sail completely away from it. I mean, you're yeah, probably you're probably pretty often to do that. <laughs> if the players' first motivation is just to kill them, you're probably doing a bad job. You're creating like like a culture of people, having them just being oh well, you just kill them because they're bad, evil people. Yeah, it's sort of binary, and well, and well, that can be cool. Yeah. Everyone needs a cool evil villain that they can punch in the face without having any moral repercussions. Like the that, orcs. Are, yeah, uh, I was, that, I was going to say, like, they're, they're sea orcs, as the book writes them. But it's okay to give your orcs some personality and have, like, eventually when you go to the orcs' land, you find out that, like, oh, no, that's just our army. We're, I don't actually support the war. And that's okay. You can have those characters. I, I think Exalted really yeah. does better if the unrepentant evil doers are reduced and humanized a little bit. Speaking of, by the way, you were mentioning some of the different, like, sea people races. On page uh, 106 of the West book for second edition, Mm -hmm. uh, there is this, just the most, like, I don't know, I find it absolutely adorable. It is like these, like, shark people 
and there's a little shark person kid. Oh yeah, oh, it's I remember absolute, that. Yeah, it's great. Like you can have all of these weird races doing weird things, and they're just people. Yeah, you, you know, you don't have to make every race different mentally from humans. Sometimes they're just weirdos who have weird genetics. It, it happens. The, oh, the wild is a thing. <laughs> As is the fact that the solars and the gods kind of made custom-made people for a while because it, I mean, it was effective. They <laughs> they gave people bodies suited for specific tasks. Like the, they had machinery that needed little people, so they made little panda people, so they could like have people climbing and machines and stuff. It, and it's the same thing with like the rest of the setting. The, the, you can kind of just wing it. You can throw a lot of new and interesting elements into the setting without breaking it, because the setting already assumes that there's more there than what's being written. Yeah, Exalted even has mermaids. They're just called uh, Pelagials. They're like half human, half manatee. It's pretty great. Yeah, and that, <laughs> that's super cool. It, uh, and the, West, the rest of the West also has a lot going for it in terms of campaign potential. Oh, yeah. Uh, let's see, starting... There's the first thing. The first thing you think when you think about the West, no matter who you... Well, I guess some people don't, but almost everyone. The first thing you think when you hear about the West is you ask yourself, do I want to play a, as a pirate or someone interacting with pirates? And the answer, almost certainly, is yes. Yes, I want to interact with pirates. From Pirates of the Caribbean to One Piece... Pirates are cool. Everyone loves pirates. Mm -hmm. And the West has them in spades. West has so many pirates. And the, the piracy isn't even always... The, the, the piracy in the West just comes from the fact that it's just so vast that no, no one group of people can really police it. And so you have these cultures that are all spe separated by water who can go and raid each other's places and, and uh, just, just take from each other. And since no one's there to stop it, and everybody's doing it, everybody does it. It's a setting where it's so big that you really can't have a singular navy controlling it. So it's basically, for the most part, unmolested ocean, which means you can have your pirate ship, and it's going to be a long time before anyone gets to following you in particular. Mm -hmm. Now, it doesn't mean you won't run into someone, or if you piss someone off enough, they won't come after you. But it does mean that there's... Well, we'll get into that later. There, there's way less... like, th It's like with the Wild Hunt. Yeah, th there's dragon-blooded running around in the West, but, I mean, how are they going to find you? It's, it's an ocean. It, it's giant. Like, they could be searching for years and not run into you. You're very rarely going to be specifically running into authorities that are going to stop you from having fun. And it means you can just be, like, the bold pirate guy who goes on epic heroics, and no one's going to stop you unless, like, they stop you in a personal way. Mm -hmm. Like, going after you themselves. Yeah, nobody has time for that. Unless you, like you said, make it make yourself a problem. <laughs> yeah, and it, and it means you don't have to worry about, like, every time you do something in front of peasants having the wild hunt chasing you down. Oh, yeah. <laughs> because... There, there's so many crazy things happening in the West. There's demon pirates running around. The Wild Hunt has enough going on in the West already. It could take them months before they even before the report about one peasant saying that a lunar was wandering around to even reach a dragon blooded. Let, let alone for him to then go there and figure out where you went. Mm -hmm. That's the cool stuff. You yeah, they're not going to go on a crusade just to find you unless yeah. you specifically cause problems. Like that actually need fixing, if you know what I mean. Yeah, yeah. I I just I like the idea of uh, of of water adventures, and I think a lot of other people do too. They they get excited about the idea of sailing the oceans and fighting pirates, but a lot of times they end up getting bored because the ocean becomes this kind of a negative space in the setting. Like you you get on your ship. And you sail to a place, and then you arrive at the place. And so you might as well just been taking a horse across land or riding on a road. So, how do you keep the adventure in the in the West? You know, how do you keep it? How do you, how do you keep it interesting? And I think that the movie Master and Commander really does a good job of showing this. It's like an hour and thirty minutes of 
just a bunch of people being on one ship and sailing in out in the Pacific. It really shows that you can have a lot of different actors and like meaning like characters on one ship. And so, you know, like if you if you think of the ship as a small city, you know, instead of like, okay, well, I'm going to go to the inn. Well, no, you don't go to the inn. You go to your crew quarters. And instead of going to the shop, you go to your quartermaster. And you take everything with you on the ship. You know, you have a supply hold, so you can be, you can be assumed to have stuff. And the, uh, the currency, on, like there, there could even be like a currency on the ship. You know, everybody gets shares of, it could be treasure, it could just be pay. And there's a culture on your ship that's unlike anywhere else in the world. And that's a really great opportunity for the storyteller and the players to all get together and build that culture. What are, your, what are some holidays that you and your people celebrate? What are some, what are just some cultural traditions that you all have? What are some superstitions that you all follow? What, do you, are there any gods that your characters venerate? Because there probably are. You probably uh, pay some worship to, at the very least, the, uh, the what is it, the uh, storm mothers out there for, for good sailing or for good weather. This kind of loops back around to how to have a fun game set in the sea. And there's a number of approaches you can take to it. One of the approaches that I found to work is to treat, well, to treat it kind of like space travel in a sci-fi game. You have points of light, and then you either don't talk about the in-between, like, take in Star Wars. Characters don't spend six months in the warp traveling between uh, one planet and another because it's boring. It's not fun to sit there and roll dice for three hours because your characters have to roll to see how well they do each mile of the trip or something. But it is fun to go from one island to another. Like, especially in a setting with a ton of islands, every island can be like its own little world. So. You can go between an island that's kind of a weird communist place to an island that's full of plant people. And why are they there? I don't know. Maybe you should go and investigate and look around and capture the lore and the setting and figure what's out what's going on. It's, it's a lot like One Piece. I, I personally oh, am God. a fan of One Piece. I enjoy it a lot. Welcome to the One Piece podcast, yeah. everybody. Yeah, oh no. And One a bunch of people find out One that the guys who are doing the Exalted podcast like anime. Big surprise. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and One Piece shows exactly how you do a game set at sea well. They have, first of all, you have all of these islands. Each island, they can sometimes get a bit gimmicky, admittedly. But each island has a ton of depth and complexity. And there's, like, there's things you need to know to sail there. It's, it's not just a flat stretch of water that goes out forever. There's stuff there, and there's currents and tides, and there's weird geological formations that you need to know about. And so it means just explaining the geography of One Piece can take half an hour, because it's a setting made for sailing. The same thing with the West. If you take the West and go towards all the cool stuff in it, you can basically create not one world but hundreds of worlds because each island is its own setting yeah like i said in a, a couple episodes back you can take an island a pretty small island and turn it into like an eight episode four episode arc yeah and if you say you have like i don't know 10 islands that are like very specific and very cool you know you can have like an entire year's campaign on just a couple islands oh absolutely <laughs> i one thing i like to do in exalted is uh take a section of the map and then like roughly draw it out onto a piece of paper but like make it big you know like be like i'm gonna take these four islands that are here all right those are gonna be the big set pieces on this and now i'm gonna add a bunch of little islands now the book says that there's this one city here and when you look at the map in exalted it'll it only shows you like 20 cities but that doesn't mean that those are the only 20 cities in the world. Every city probably has towns and roads and all these things that are leading away from it that you should add. So when you when you do this, throw like eight or nine more cities onto these small islands. Look at the uh, look at Hawaii. 
and how many cities it packs onto its islands. Like, you don't just have one thing on one island. <laughs> uh, and, like, an island can be its own diverse playground for you to play on. And when you're done on it, that doesn't mean it goes away. Things are still happening on that island, and people are leaving and coming, and things change. And this loops into the next thing that's cool about sea-based games. Oh, yeah. Is there's a lot, and I mean a lot, of treasure. There is a very, like, human-animal brain desire to collect wealth and stuff. And a sea-based game kind of does that. The, the, that was the motivation of so many sailors throughout history, to get rich. That's why pirates rob people. That's why privateers rob people the government likes, d- doesn't like. <laughs> That's why all of these groups did things. And, that, and it was all out there for the pursuit of wealth on the open sea. And there's something very satisfying about that, to go around and get rich. And yeah, I, I know, in, in Exalted, you can just, with a merit, just become, start the game fabulously wealthy, I know. But there's still something fun in collecting treasures and mementos of the various adventures you've been on. It's very, it's very satisfying in like a very raw, animalistic way. <laughs> Accession of <laughs> Exalted, where we got like the cool amulet and we still have it today. And it's like you're going to like the end of the whole campaign ending, and you have you got everyone has like all these cool little artifacts they collected from all of their travels. Yeah, yeah, and they don't even have to do anything, they could just be these cool things that they found. Like, yeah, I, I wear that still. That 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 was a neat thing. I like it. I'm not taking it to a museum. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, now the next thing. The next thing is something that I think everyone who enjoys sea campaigns is particularly fond of. Do you, do you guys want to say it all together? You guys okay. ready? So, there is one thing that I think, regardless of what you as a player have done, I think there's one thing that we can all agree is great. Monsters! Monsters. <laughs> that was perfect, yeah. We did yeah, it. That, that we nailed was... it, guys. Yeah. Nailed it on the first try. <laughs> sea monsters are amazing, especially when they are attacking your castle. Your ship. Your ship no, is uh, your castle, in case that wasn't clear. <laughs> yeah. Because this is something cool. Like, monsters... The thing is, the sea is kind of terrifying. Like, even now, even with all of our advanced modern technology... There, a lot of the sea we just have never seen and don't understand in any meaningful way. Like, the water is an alien environment that is honestly more confusing and scary than space. Mm-hmm. It's There's something primitive about how uncomfortable the open ocean is to people. Like, like no one really... Like, yeah, there's people that love the open ocean, but... There's something kind of... There's a part of you that wants to be afraid of it. Like, it's dangerous. It's daunting. Yeah. For anybody who's ever... Who's never actually gotten to lean over a boat and look down into deep water and just see black. Like, it, it's something. It's, it's something very interesting, and... The monsters themselves, though, you can kind of just do whatever. Because they're sea monsters, and... There's so many legends of sea monsters. You could you could come up with hundreds of them and have each one be kind of unique. The Kraken. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, you just released yeah. it. <laughs> yeah, and, and there's the thing like almost all sea monsters, especially if it's the first one the players are encountering, end up just being krakens. Yeah, but like you could also go the route of coming up with some weird abomination of the sea that shouldn't exist but does. It's it, creation is a crazy place with spirits and elementals and demons and there's the wild and fey. Pretty much anything can come out of the ocean. Th- mm-hmm. there, there's no real limitation to what can crawl out of there, and it means that you have an almost endless supply of cool boss fights with crazy monsters, <laughs> because the ocean's spooky. Yeah. And in Exalted, it's a magic demon ocean that the farther out you go the less real it becomes as it slowly weaves itself out of creation. And the water stops becoming salt because there's no more earth in the water. 
and you hit patches of water that you sink in and can breathe in because nothing makes sense. It's creation. I love Exalted. <laughs> yeah, like, it's so crazy. You can just, oh, yeah, we hit some hard water. Oh, what does that mean? Does it have, like, high... No, 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 it's hard. We, yeah, no, it we, means... We rammed into it. We're, uh, we need to get the oars and, We're going to have like... to get out and walk on the hard water and uh, drag the ship around it because it can't sail through this hard water. It's not ice. It's just hard. Yeah, you, it's okay. It's it's kind of like it's like mud. You just get out there and it, you'll be fine. Trust me. You'll know when you run off of it. <laughs> we basically just have to peel it off the ship. It, it's going to slow us down. <laughs> That's a thing. You can actually encounter that. You can run into water that you can breathe in. It, it really lets the DM be creative with what the players run into because it's really whatever your imagination can come up with the uh like between all that like the environment itself can become either a protagonist or an antagonist it's something to be feared and basically dealt with like when heavy rains hit you have to deal with that you know if uh, uh, what about what what if a uh, giant wave comes crashing over your ship or you could see it on the horizon, like the horizon actually gets dark, and the people on your ship realize that that's a wave and it's coming to you. What do you do? Do you do you seek land? Do you do you hope that the wave, you know, goes away somehow? Do you go under? Do you take your ship underwater because maybe it's some kind of a some kind of a submarine ship? You you might have options and uh, magic to help you deal with that, but it's. A choice. It's it's a series of decisions that can really shape how things go. You know, do you how do how you how do you defeat the weather? Do you use magic to make it better? Do you just deal with it until it passes? What do you do if it doesn't pass? What do you what do you do when you find out that you made a storm mother angry, and she's taking it out on you because they are not good people. Storm mothers are the worst. <laughs> By the way, for viewers of ho at home. What he's saying is, it's time to kill a god. Yeah. <laughs> or get her fired. Yeah, storm mothers are goddesses who oversee the elemental courts and uh, matters of weather. And especially out in the west, where it's nice and secluded from the realm and from the Immaculate Faith, who will do an episode in the future, they don't really have to worry about people coming and hunting them down for being just the worst. And they're kind of, they kind of follow the tro trope of being this, these universally ugly people. Uh, often uh, female, according to the book, but gods can change their genders. They're, 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 they have a fluid nature. So they can be whatever you want them to be. So it could be a storm father. Who cares? Do what you want. It's your game. That's the only canon that matters. Everything else is fanfic. But... So you have the storm god, and she's mad at you, or he's mad at you. What do you do about it? Like, like, uh, like uh, Jared just said, you could try to get her fired if you want, or you could try to hunt her down and deal with the problem. That's where adventure comes in. How are you going to find her? Where are you going to look for her? Who can you talk to to, uh, to deal with this problem? What quest can you go on to find the magic compass that leads you to her front door? Sounds like a pretty awesome adventure. Yeah, and you can do that. You, this is a thing, and we touched on this briefly last episode, but an exalted, like, a, a group of exalted, they can just walk up in a god's house and beat him up and bully him into doing what they want. They're, they are, by canon, the beings that kill <sighs> the super gods that not even the gods could directly face because the super gods built in, like pre-built commands not to hurt them they killed things that literally sh weren't built to die and it was considered impossible before the solar well not the solars the exalted host what, what would be the term for the exalted like all of them as a collective the exalted host uh, alternatively okay. there's the term atrocity to describe a group of exalted ah okay you know the like, entire like a murder of crows <laughs> yeah the entire exalted atrocity was able to break logic and kill things that shouldn't be killed. So some pansy storm mother, even if she might be able to put up a good fight, you can literally just kill her. And someone else will be sent to replace her eventually. And they might hate you even more than the last lady. Or they might go, you know what? 
I don't want to get murdered. Let's uh, let's give them good weather while they're in my area because the last lady that uh, gave them bad weather, well, her brain scattered on the wall there, and you know <laughs> what? Not for me. <laughs> so they're getting sunny days whenever they're through <laughs> my region. Once again, proving that the only matter, the the only force that matters is physical violence. <laughs> You, you could also, you, you could also, by the way, for those of you who are wondering, you could also just, like, use your impossible supernatural skills at convincing to just convince them to do it, too. But, you know, most parties tend to like to go the uh, beat something head in until it does what you want position. I don't know. I've seen I've seen groups do uh, any mix of them. One of the issues is with that is that Exalted, at least in 2E, uh, the uh, ability to use social mechanics was a little bit flawed initially and they never really got around to fully fixing it but I don't know I, I, have, I have a thing in mind that might be a good hot fix for if we decide to play a exalted game so that that's an option you can go in and be like no I'm, I'm just gonna talk to this person even though I know that drawing my sword and removing this character would make my would just be easier oh wait it's not just easier because social works now oh good so like all this is going on here. You're out there. You're 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 you got this vendetta against this god, but the thing is, there's no police out here. You know, we touched on this before, but I just have to stress again. It's so vast out here in the West that there's there's no cops to hunt for you. You go and do this, and you walk away, and you're probably going to be fine, unless somebody with a specific vendetta against you decides to come looking for you which could also be a very cool story you know like why is that ship following us what is their deal what did we do to them that makes them want to follow us like we don't want to go talk to them and deal with them because there might be something terrible on that boat they might have guns and that's that's a nightmare we like our ship our ship is our home no just keep sailing <laughs> why do they keep finding us why are the authorities hundreds of miles out of regular civilization most of the time, you're just not going to run into someone that's going to... Well, you're, you're running into local resistance. Like, if you bust into someone's base of operation and start killing people, yeah, they're going to put up a fight. But, like, if you leave, unless they, the people that you attacked, decide, oh, yeah, we're going to hunt him down now, generally nothing's... No one's going to come because what are they going to do? Call 911? <laughs> yeah, like... That is... There. But then there's also... The authorities specifically can't cover every nook and cranny, and if they could, why? Oh yeah, like you, you have to have a, such a huge fleet. You would have to have an American Navy-sized fleet in order to do it. But the, there's also the the inverse of this, in that if you do something on an island and those islanders find out about it, you could easily become a legend, for good or for ill, because with such a small area, you know, messengers only travel over there with word and stuff like your your reputation in a given area could quickly start to precede you yeah if you're doing cool heroic stuff like if you're saving people and just being this like figure of legend that legend might spread faster than you move and you might arrive in places where they basically view you as a god because well you kind of are i mean <laughs> you're not a god in the literal sense but you're a superhero in a world that really, really needs heroes. <laughs> and people are going to notice that. They're going to start, you know, hoping. Because things are bad enough in the West that people need hope. Yeah, people, things are just kind of bad almost everywhere. Like, it, Exalted is kind of built with this idea in mind that there are monsters everywhere. And the only thing that's really permanently holding them back and keeping them from just coming in and wrecking the uh, just your average mortal is the fact that they have these heroes to hide behind. Even if they're not super common, they're out there enough that the things outside of the world don't come in. The populations are focused into very tight little bunches. And that means that heroism spreads, and it also means that villainy spreads, and that and that's neat. That yeah, I, I, I love the idea of just like you could have like a host of NPCs that 
Like, it, you as a storyteller could tell your players, yeah, when you're walking around the island, you just overhear stories about this person, this person, and this person. Here you go, and you just hand out some little pamphlets for them to read through and go, oh, wow, that's, <laughs> that's a bad dude. All right, we probably wouldn't want to mess with them. Oh, wait. Oh, no, that's a ship that's been following us. Okay, hang on. We're both kind of bad dudes. Maybe we should talk to them instead. <laughs> Maybe they want to hire us. And that's what's so cool. You have the fr you have the freedom to create a story of heroism that is a lot less constrained than in the other directions because everything's more free in the ocean. That that's one of the reason that's one of the reasons why people actually set sail to places is for the freedom it gives them. Mm -hmm. And that freedom also leads to less organization, more anarchy, but it's freedom that lets you be a hero, and that's cool. And there's other uh, set pieces in this area as well. In fact, there's so much room for additional set pieces if you really want to go that route. Uh, when you look at the map, you can see there's just this vast ocean that's probably the Pacific Ocean Plus. And in that ocean, there are currents, there are, there are reefs, there are just dangerous things in those waters, and so people typically follow very specific uh, routes when they're sailing through them and the fact that people are using these p specific routes to get to and from the the far islands in the west means that you could just start slapping down islands and just nations into that area just as much as you want and because they're so isolated it's not going to matter for the rest of creation you, you just do it however you want you want to have like a big city full of freaky fish dudes do it i encourage it you have my seal of approval they can all be catfish themed, so they also have little cat ears, but their whiskers are those little catfish barbels. <laughs> yeah, and there's so much empty space in the West, and this is a positive and a negative. There is, basically, if you look at the map, there's about, uh, there's a little island chain that it gives, and then there's just this massive, empty stretch of nothingness. And on one hand, that means that it makes the West look kind of boring when you look at it from an objective level. Because, like, the North. The North has stuff happening. The East has stuff happening. But the West is just this little spot of land. And that can be limiting. But it also means that you as the DM can pretty much pencil in anything. It is can... pretty much a... Sorry, it is pretty much a sandbox. Yeah, mm -hmm. you can pencil in island change and... Like, you could even have a little hidden continent that all, that no one knows about because it you have to go through a bunch of, like, really dangerous waterways and stuff to get to it. Mm -hmm. And it's just this island that's been completely cut off from the rest of the world since before the solars fell. And that's just what happened. Yeah, it is perfectly okay. Your players won't care. It'd be really weird if, like... Huh, I wonder why that's there. If you feel that the ocean is, is too vast or has doesn't have a lot of uh, islands, just make an archipelago everywhere. Yeah. Just, like, make another island. I make love that idea. Island. Like, have it be so that there's no, there are no deep oceans. The only deep ocean yeah. is what's past the land. Everything else is archipelagos, uh, volcano is or volcanic islands where you could have, like, these fire domains. You could have... Just all kinds of just nonsense out there, and it would be amazing because now your sailing adventures, like you never you never really leave sight of land, but it's more expansive than the water. You know, you're still having all the uh, all the adventures, but it's more closer to home. I think I'd I'd say. Yeah, it, it, because the thing is, if you look at what actual sailing is like. There's a lot of, okay, we left port, and now we're going to spend six months with nothing being visible in any direction while nothing happens. And that can be unfun. That, that can be really unfun. And so it's good to stretch, like, practical land positioning occasionally in the name of making the game more fun. Have interesting places literally everywhere. Because it's creation. Cre creation was literally made by bored gods. You know, I just thought... It like, was made to be... Just off the top of my head, like, you're sailing, you're sailing, you're sailing, there's nothing there. Then you hit that thick water we were talking about. Your ship comes to a stop. Everybody groans because, oh, we gotta go deal with this. But then you find out that uh, 
like that thick water was kind of put there by water elementals. So you go to the side of the ocean and or sit to the side of the ship. You look down. You wave at them. There's a bunch of like nymphs and other uh, nymphs and nixies and whatever down there, and they you know ask if they can come aboard. And it turns out that it's like a stop that they have. They're like, yeah, we we'll give your ship. We'll give you all a chance to rest. We can give you some food and this and that. And now, at that point, you have a bunch of these strange things coming on your ship. Do you welcome them? Do you fight them off? Do you... How, how much do you trust them? How trustworthy do they deserve to be? You should ask yourself as the storyteller, you know, like... What's going on here? But these types of places could just be kind of out there. Like, there could be a god of the ocean who just does this as a way to get worship from people and become more popular. Like, yeah, I, there's there's no land out for, you know, anywhere around here. This is kind of the last stop before that long journey. Boy, wouldn't you like to have some fresh food and those those rations are looking a little stale. And then it turns out that they just want to eat your crew. You know, or not. It's up to you. You, you know, this is the thing. That is that, that sounds like such a fun encounter to, like, interact with. Like, there's just these weird water people that it's like a weird truck stop, but with <laughs> boats. It's like, uh, <laughs> I am uncomfortable with this, but I also don't know how to react to this. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's okay to be an over your head and exalted. It's fine. Just roll with it. Don't worry about it. Re- remember yeah, your, uh, what's it called? Your essence fever? <laughs> just go do stuff. Yeah. And this is the fun part. If things do go south and it does turn out that they want to eat your kidneys or something, you're exalted. You can just beat them. Yeah. Like you you can punch them and kill all of them. So you don't have to be so afraid and cautious and jaded that you end up being in like normal RPGs. Because in normal RPGs, if you trust the weird bandits, they can just kill you and take you prisoner or something. It's going to be a lot harder to do that to a group of any exalted because they're exalted. Oh yeah. And things like like there's very few things in exalted that are stronger than exalted. And a bunch of random nymphs at a weird stop in the water are not going to stop exalted. So like the issue becomes then not will these people kill us? It's more, are they going to try to inconvenience us, and will they end up hurting the crew in some way? Because Exalted is really smart in that there's two things that Exalted kind of bans. There's two things that it doesn't let happen ever. True resurrection, so going from dead to being alive, and time travel. Mm -hmm. And so if a few of your crew members get killed, there's no bringing them back, unless you want to bring them back as ghosts or something. Yep, and ghosts are not them, like... Like you, you, you could have them as a ghost possess somebody, but they're still going to be them as a ghost, and they come with their own set of uh, rules and their own set of uh, baggage. And it's very likely that they'll just finish whatever business they had and eventually just disappear into what's called Leth, which is the name they give to uh, reincarnation. And then they're gone forever. And that that that's cool. Like a lot, a lot of games give access to pretty easy resurrection and we're going off on a tangent again of course (laughs) but a lot of games give access to easy resurrection and exalted by not letting you do that it makes all death have meaning because if a normal human dies that that's kind of it that that their story is over they're dead and that that can be harsh, especially if it's an NPC that the players cared about that gets killed because the players were too trusting of the random sea nymphs. But at the same time, it means that the threat is different, and so the way the players interact with the threat changes. Because they're no longer thinking about themselves, now they're thinking about their entire crew. Which, if you've read any media about the sea, caring about your crew over yourself is kind of like one of the the massive pillars, it, it's like a massive trope about sea-based stories, and that's cool to have a way to naturally incorporate it into the story. Especially when you're going out into the sea for weeks, uh, having no people is, having, like, when you have allies by your side during ships, you know, you're not going to go insane, possibly. You know, you're not going to, like, just die, like, yeah, separation from everybody else, that, that isolation, 
can, is also like a big thing in uh, in in this kind of a uh, setting because like if your ship sinks, what are you gonna do? And that that should also be in the back of everybody's mind. You know what what do we do if the worst happens and our boat is destroyed? Do we do we get on flotsam and hope that something can find us? Maybe one of us has a summoning spell where we can summon water elementals to come and you know carry us back. Can we breathe water and just go to the bottom of the ocean and walk our way back? What do we do about our stuff? How do we get our stuff back? Because you can you can do whatever you want to a player's family, but don't touch their loot. Yeah, like you cut off a player's arm, beat them half to death. A player's them. arm, not the character. The player. Yeah. They they won't the care. Player. But if you touch if you touch their character's loot, oh, they'll lose it. They'll pick, They'll take their arm back and start beating you with it. <laughs> <laughs> and that's the thing. Though so seriously, like you want to mo- like and and never do this artificially. Yeah. Because taking player stuff artificially to make them hate someone, that's not fun. But if it happens naturally as the during the course of play in a way that like yeah we totally opened ourselves up and let, and tried to attack a ship that was larger than ours and it got sunk because. The ship was larger than ours, and we didn't really have weapons on our ship. It was a really dumb idea, and so our ship shank. That's going to make the players have a blood feud against whoever made them lose their stuff. Because human beings are very obsessive about collecting stuff. And in RPGs, that attribute is amplified. Players are very, very materialistic. And you start messing with their horde... You're going to have... They're going to levy creative punishments on whatever entity or god or hypothetical being it is that tries to mess with their stuff. Alright, so that's that's a 52-minute uh, cast, guys. Do you want to start wrapping it up here? Yeah, though we do have the uh, thing about the elementals. I, I don't know if we really need to cover it specifically. That's kind of like a setting thing that we were basically going to be like, this is a thing. You can... You can remove it if you want. <laughs> Fair guess, enough. Like uh, we we could we could really hammer on that when we get to like the elementals and the gods and how they that's interact true. with creation, because that that's kind of a, ca- a thing on its own. Yeah, we'd have to explain like the whole concept to. Okay, yeah, you're fair. Yeah, I'm like looking at that like, mmm, uh, guys. <laughs> okay, so this whole talk that we've been having. We've been discussing all of the little parts you can do about this campaign. But the big thing about the West, the thing that every DM who plays it and every player who plays it and everyone involved has to understand, is you kind of have to capture that childhood love of the ocean. The tropes, the cheesy stuff, the cool stuff. You have to kind of capture the excitement for it because... It's a setting that is inherently kind of cheesy. It, it, it's pirate guys doing pirate things and running around, and there's demon dudes who they're grumpy pirate guys who you have to fight, and there's all sorts of crazy stuff happening. And if you try to play it like with this hard face straightness all the time, it will get kind of weird. So for the DMs out there listening, remember to try and instill in your players and keep to yourself that like the wonder you had as a child reading stories about pirates and the the fun Tr- try and capture why it makes you why the idea of playing a pirate captivates pe- players as much as they can and try and like keep that close and really try to beat that into your games <laughs> Yeah, look, go check out Pirates of Dark Water. I don't think the show ever actually got to finish, but that was a pretty cool show that I used to watch when I was a kid. It's about these three people who go around and they're running away from some dude and some guy has a broken sword that, I don't know, it's it, it does something. It's a key or maybe a broken sword for some reason. It's one of those artifacts he told you about. It's a cool thing he has. And whenever this dark water shows up, and starts trying to devour their ships, They everybody leaves. Everybody, like, fights get called off because, oh man, dark water is here. Go. Run away. That's that's the monster, you know? You're, you're, you're arguing with another ship's crew, and you're about to come to blows, and then a tentacle starts to snake out of the water. 
And before the monster itself can come in in its entirety, everybody just says, no, we're out. We'll, we'll handle this later. This is not important enough to stay here and die from this, whatever that is. Yeah, and that's super cool. That That's fun. Uh, for viewing, for those of you out there who really want to get into the pirate mood, I would suggest two things. I would suggest uh, the first Pirates of the Caribbean movie. The rest are horrible. Please, God, don't watch them. The, the first one, though, is okay. <laughs> uh, the One Piece manga? The anime is also good for those of you that don't really do manga. The you can just watch the anime. It's okay, though. Not as good as the manga. Uh, it really captures some of the... Well, it's less pirates and more just adventure on the sea, which it has the rough power level of Exalted already. So you can kind of get a vibe for sea things and how to make the sea fun. Like, there's a, there's a YouTuber, for example, called Teching, who has a whole series explaining the geography of One Piece. And you can just steal ideas. Like, like, just reach in, just reach in, take an idea, and just take it. Because, because your players, even if your if your players don't know about it, it'll just be a cool idea that they've never seen. And if they do know about it, they'll be happy because they'll know that you're stealing ideas from One Piece, and that's cool. <laughs> I was just gonna say, like, if <laughs> oh no, you're stealing a thing from a show that I like. Rad. When we eventually start talking about the Princes of the Universe podcast. I cannot wait because there are Transformers references. Oh god, it's gonna be so good. I can't wait. Oh yeah, uh, Princes of the Universe. I do. Do they go to the Do they go to the West ever? No, they they sell it to the Lunars. <laughs> They're like the West is oh, garbage. Yeah. We don't even want to. We don't even want to look at it. We'll own the rest of creation. <laughs> <laughs> good lord. Wait, so they Canada the? I mean, not Canada. They uh, Alaska the West. Oh yeah, they uh, they they Louisiana purchased the West <laughs> for basically oh, nothing. God. Like like, hey, Lunar, I want you to go and I don't know, try to try to do this one mission. The Lunar's like, all right, I want a quarter of everything, all of it. And the player who was doing it was like, okay, sure. Uh, there's just oceans out there. I don't care. I'm never going there, ever. <laughs> And then she goes back to the rest of the circle, and they're like, you, you did what? <laughs> <laughs> oh, man, that's fantastic. So this has been the Pod Podcast cast. I'm Ark. I'm Jarrett. And I'm Insuling. And thanks for watching. Bye-bye.